It is with the greatest pleasure that I welcome our first speaker and the sponsor of our forum, Pat Smith from the Lyme Disease Association. Pat is, <laughs> Pat is a Monmouth uh, College or Monmouth University graduate and is beginning her 20th year as president of the all volunteer run national nonprofit Lyme Disease Association, which is LDA. Pat is a member of Columbia University's Lyme and Tick-Borne Diseases Research Center Advisory Committee. She's a member of the Programmatic Panel Member for the Tick-Borne Diseases Research Program in the Department of Defense, Congressionally Directed Medical Research Program, member of the Food and Drug Administration's PESP Partnership to promote avoidance of tick exposure, and member of the Tick IPM Working Group with federal and non-federal members from the IPM Institute of North America to eradicate tick-borne diseases. She has twice testified before Congress and is former chair of the New Jersey Governor's Lyme Disease Advisory Council. She is also a former officer for the International Lyme and Associated Diseases Society, a professional medical society. Pat has been an incredible support for our group, as well as a personal mentor in our efforts to raise awareness in, here in Colorado and throughout the Rocky Mountains. We are so grateful to Pat for the sponsorship of the Lyme Disease Association, and we welcome her. Um, she's an amazing woman. Pat. Um, I have a nice large bottle of water, which I'll probably consume <laughs> as I'm going along here today. Um, and so you'll have to excuse me if once in a while I need to take a drink of that water to keep moving because uh, this is a, a kind of a lengthy presentation, but I think it's important to me, my role here today was to show you what is happening nationwide with the disease because we're a mobile society and everyone is going every place and they're taking their family, they're taking their pets, and it's very important when you have a disease like Lyme that can affect everyone. So briefly a little bit about the association, we raise research, education, prevention, support monies. 97% of our monies go directly to programs since we are all volunteer and always have been. Uh, we've awarded over 100 research grants and and we're very happy to report we are in uh, our research that we have funded has now appeared in 37 peer-reviewed journal publications. Uh, we helped to endow the Columbia Lyme and Tick-Borne Disease Research Center with uh, our then Connecticut partners, Time for Lyme. Uh, we've awarded educational grants, over 100 of those, to organizations for projects such as this. Uh, we have a Lyme Aid for Kids program uh, with author Amy Tan, who helped us initiate the program because she has chronic Lyme disease and has oftentimes uh, interfered with her, her career. And we are part of the combined federal campaign, which means basically that's the government's uh, seal of approval on our charity as a workplace giving uh, fund. Um, and the you know, in the EPA, you've already heard about that. We're a Guide Star Gold member. Um, we also partner with 43 organizations across the country. Um, and that is very important because they help us with national issues. We help them with state issues. And uh, you've heard probably most of the rest of it. We do have a doctor referral system on our website. And we have a very active Facebook um, so LDA's research philosophy is because of there's limited funding for Lyme disease over the years, we have uh, funded some long-term costly studies, but mostly what we try to do is give uh, smaller amounts of studies that can generate preliminary data so that those researchers can get government funding. And we do pilot studies, um, which is a very small scale study or what they call proof of concept to see if something is going to work. Um, and also, very importantly, and I did not, I was not aware of this when I started, sometimes these research teams, if they don't get funding in, they will dissolve. And then maybe later they'll get big funding, but they no longer have a team. So sometimes we step in and we'll fund the team. We even funded a government team for about three months until they could get their uh, government funding approved. So these are some of the kinds of things and we've given out grants for. 
200,000, 250,000, uh, you know, half a million or more. Uh, but mostly we, we try to stay in 50,000, 75,000, um, you know, even smaller amounts, 25,000, depending on the project. Now, the next two slides basically are just a list of some of the researchers and their institutions, and we do fund research coast to coast. Um, and we actually even work with a retired uh, a scientist here in Colorado who has uh, recently walked the Appalachian Trail, and we gave him some funds. So he, was, he collected ticks and had them tested, and that recently was uh, published, which we were very happy in, in the, uh, the, park, uh, the National Park Journal. And um, anyway, this is the 37 peer-reviewed journals, that articles that have featured research that we have supported and we've been acknowledged in. We're very proud of that because if you get published, if your research gets published in peer review, what does that mean? Well, that means that now all the other scientists around the world have access to that information and they can now build upon that, which is what you want to happen. So some of the current projects we're funding uh, at, at Johns Hopkins with Dr. Zhang, um, and some of you may know he's doing work with persisters and looking at uh, experimental, well, not really experimental, but novel treatments with antibiotics um, for uh, those persister cells. Um, also, the University of Connecticut, uh, Dr. Angelis Boza, and uh, he's looking at new ways uh, to therapeutically treat Lyme disease. Uh, University of Toledo with Dr. Travis Taylor, he's looking at Powassan virus, which is becoming a serious concern, and I'll talk about that. North Carolina State with Dr. Uh, Breitschwert, who's doing all the work with the, um, the Bartonella. Uh, Rutgers University, Dr. Steven Schutzer, whom we've worked with for many years, who's doing not just looking for the different organisms in ticks, um, but also then matching those to what are in people and doing a lot of genomic mapping. Um, and I mentioned Carl Ford, who's the environmental scientist here in Colorado, and also at Shenandoah University School of Pharmacy, a small project on whether there are uh, genetic variations in people that may influence chronic Lyme disease. That's just a picture of the Columbia Research Center opening when we endowed the center in 2007. And we also partner with Columbia University, and each year we host an annual uh, continuing medical education um, conference for physicians. This year we're working on, we hope, one where it's going to be in Minneapolis this year in October. Um, we'll have more details on the website soon for on that. Um, that's our education grants. That's our Lime Aid for Kids that we give to children whose families don't have the money maybe to get them started with testing or perhaps start treatment. These are some of the materials that LDA has produced. Most of our materials are available on the website. Um, we did something called Literati with Lyme with uh, author Amy Tan, also Meg Cabot, who's done The Princess Diaries. She has Lyme disease, and uh, Jordan Fisher-Smith, who was a park ranger, who has written a couple of books on his Lyme and how it has influenced his life. And uh, it was an interesting uh, thing we did it at, I think we presented that at NYU. Um, and on our website, we also have a number of different things for kids. We're very into what is happening with our children and tick-borne diseases. And we have a module that you can run or a school can run right from there, a PowerPoint, um, how a tick can make you sick. Um, and also, we worked with uh, uh, the, well, it was the University of Medicine and Dentistry, now Rutgers University, to develop a video which is on our website and it was created especially for children four to eight um, and that's there everything is accessible for free and by the way our website is under uh, we're, we're moving it so if you get on and you say oh this is awfully slow it's because it's not fully moved on to the new platform yet and we're making improvements hopefully that should happen within the next week or two that we should be finished 
Um, so now on to Lyme disease. Lyme disease, first of all, is found in more than 80 countries worldwide. People like to think it's just here. It isn't. This is a map of Europe, and this shows the distribution of a tick called Exodes ricinus, and that is one of the ticks that carry the disease in Europe, and of course the red means that the tick is present all over there, and the yellow means basically that the uh, the chick vector has been introduced there, but it may not be firmly established yet, but it's working on it. And you can see it's all over, folks. Um, this is a map which we have many of these on our website. And uh, this, you can go and in there, you can download them, you can print them out, you can use them for your educational purposes. And this shows the cases from 1990 through 2014. And if you go in, you can click on your state, and it'll show the history of that state, whether that state has reported cases over time. Now, over this time period, Colorado, for example, had 13 reported cases. Um, but we all know now that Lyme disease is un underreported by, by 10, by a factor of 10. So over that time, there were probably at least 130 cases. And since this is a state that doesn't necessarily uh, recognize Lyme disease, whether it's here, it's not here, no one really knows for sure, I think, at this point in time. Um, and so there may even be more cases because the doctors are not necessarily looking for it. Now, where were these cases obtained? Were they obtained when people traveled? Were they obtained in the state? There's really not an answer to that. Um, I did question the CDC on that and then they said well the states that don't have um, the tick vector those people all get it from traveling and I said well could I see what data you have to support that because we have states all over at that time that they were saying there was no Lyme in and so I asked for that data and basically there was no such data they, that was a generalized statement based on the fact that they had no evidence that the tick vector was present. Now this comes from Chris Newby. Some of you may know her from the Under Our Skin video. She does a great job at a graphing. And the little gray at the bottom that you see, those are the reported cases. And the green shows uh, a 6 to 12. If it's 6% if it's underreported, um, it, it's part way up there. And if it's 12% underreported, it's at the cases would be at the top level. It, this is just to give you an idea of how much Lyme disease is, is really out there. Now, these were the reported cases from 2014. Now, 2015 numbers are not yet final. They don't finalize the number until the following year. So this August, around this August, the CDC will come out with the final numbers from 2015 because they're still collecting the data from the different states. And you can see that uh, um, although there are, you know, are certainly a lot of northeastern states here in the top 15, we also have uh, Minnesota and Wisconsin, and now we have Illinois. I think that's the first year, if I'm not mistaken, that that was in the, the top 15. So. What does the CDC MMWR, which is a publication that they, uh, they put out every week, what has that said about Lyme disease? Well, in 2009, CDC said that the Lyme incidence uh, was uh, higher than that of the incidence of HIV, and only certain sexually transmitted diseases had a higher incidence rate. In 2014, they said it was the fifth most common nationally notifiable disease. And from 2002 to 2007, CDC did uh, some data on deaths from Lyme and Rocky Mountain spotted fever. And of course, the feeling had always been in the past, Lyme didn't cause death. Um, but here it showed that each had reported 36 cases over that time, 36 cases where death was involved. And these were, of course, you know, confirmed from the CDC. And in 2013, the CDC announced uh, that sudden cardiac deaths from Lyme, where they had now confirmed several of those deaths, and more, I understand, since then. So we know, indeed, that deaths do occur from Lyme disease. Now, what about children? Children are at the highest risk of acquiring Lyme. 
And in 2013, the CDC had announced, and I'm sure a lot of you heard it, that 300,000 Lyme cases actually occur in this country, and they based it on some real studies that had been done. And so that it's underreported, as I mentioned earlier, by a factor of 10. So those reported numbers are going to look very small. Um, and so the LDA did an estimate based on the numbers from CDC over that time period. And children from birth through 19 made up 30% of the reported cases over that time period. So in 2014, for example, there were 33,451 cases reported in the US. And if you multiply that by 10, of course, you get 334,510 cases. 30% of those were children, which means 100,350 children between 0 to 19 developed new Lyme in 2014. And this is just a little pie graph, which shows you uh, how much of the pie that our children, unfortunately, take up. Now, this is a CDC graph. Again, I'm almost done with the graphs, but I think it's important to, for you to see where the problems lie and how they are progressing. Nothing is going down, let's put it that way. Um, and here it shows that the highest numbers, again, are children, uh, especially 5 to 9, and then 10 to 14, and boys in particular. Um, and so I, I, they, I already told you about the age groups. Unfortunately, from zero to four are babies, guys. 5% of the reported cases from 2001 to 2010 were our babies. So the born and unborn are affected by Lyme disease. Now, what does that mean? It basically means that pregnant women can transmit Lyme to the fetus through the placenta and could cause birth defects and death of the fetus. And this is a photo, uh, unfortunately, from a fetal brain fry, uh, Dr. Alan McDonald, who's one of uh, the researchers and, and a pathologist. Um, dogs, cats, and Lyme, uh, excuse me, dogs and cats can get Lyme disease, and dogs actually act as what they call sentinels. And so they're often diagnosed first with a disease in an area before people even know that their area is hit. Suddenly, the vets are going to see an increase in cases because dogs are more than 50% likely to get the disease than people. They tend to roll in the leaves, um, run unchecked into chick habitats. They can bring un uh, unattached chicks into the home. And dogs can also get ehrlichiosis and anaplasmosis, a diseases I'm going to mention a little bit later. Cats get less Lyme, probably because they are really good groomers, if you've ever owned a cat. They can incessantly in groom. However, as a, as a longtime cat owner and as one whose cat just got Lyme last year after I pulled off three ticks, one of which was fully engorged, I can tell you they can and do get Lyme and uh, they do get treated and they can recover from it. Um, dogs can get a very serious form of Lyme and it can affect um, their kidneys. Um, so. Anyway, uh, these numbers come from the Companion Animal Parasite Council, um, and they estimate that these numbers represent 30, less than 30% of activity in a geographic region. So what do these numbers mean? Well, let's take, for example, first the state of Pennsylvania, which had the highest case numbers. And in 2015, for human Lyme, I put them in order of that, and then uh, in 2015, they tested 274,978 dogs in Pennsylvania. And out of those, 13.61% were positive for Lyme. That was one out of seven dogs. And those dogs represented almost 15% of the dogs in the US who ha were tested and have Lyme. Now, these results that the CAP presents on here um, those only come from two veterinary laboratories. So there's other Lyme tests out there from other laboratories that aren't being included in these numbers. 
Now, the, the uh, Companion Animal Parasite Council, I happen to know the, the president, Susan Little. She's a wonderful veterinarian, uh, University of Oklahoma, and I called her and she gave me permission to, uh, to screenshot this to show you uh, how they put this out, and anyone can access this online. And what I did here was when you pull up the state of Colorado and you click Lyme disease, then you can uh, click on the state and show the counties where those dogs came from. So that shows you the darker the counties, that says a high risk there. Uh, the, the lesser, it goes moderate risk, low risk, and then the gray is they have no data. Now again, dogs do travel with people, and we all know that. And of course, we know that probably many of your dogs have visited me in New Jersey for example, uh, or if uh, you know you're going to somewhere more glamorous, uh, you know one of the other states. Um, so anyway, but this is a really good resource for anyone that uh, needs to have those kinds of things. Now I wanted to mention this, not just because I just got back from Maine and had a, uh, Dr. Cameron and I were up there for a presentation that we sponsored up in, in Maine and we had 300 people come out uh, for the event. Um, it's a big problem up there. But I, I need you to understand that there are many types of ticks and there are ticks that are infecting humans and there are pets, but there are also ticks that are infecting other animals in the environment, whether it be our, our cattle uh, or whatever animal. And this to me was interesting because it shows how these ticks are spreading horribly. This was a New Hampshire study and, and begun in 2001. And basically, the average moose in New Hampshire whatever that means, carried about 35,000 ticks. But now they know that they can have up to 160,000 ticks on one moose, folks. Now, what's happening, the ticks are sucking out so much blood that uh, the, the moose are dying from exsanguination. They're bleeding to death from these ticks on the moose. And so what happens, the moose is unable to survive the winter. And so they rub themselves against the trees to try to get rid of the ticks. And so what happens is their fur is gone and they actually uh, get white, they become white and they're called ghost moose. And so what's happened now is uh, in New Hampshire, close to 100% of moose now have their hair scraped off. And in uh, the New Hampshire had 41% of deaths of their moose over a five year period due to, excuse me, due to the ticks. And the winter of 2014 in New Hampshire, they had these radio collared moose and 64% uh, of the radio collared moose calves died from tick overloads. And so what's happening in Minnesota, a little closer to you guys, 50 to 70,000 ticks were infesting moose. That's 10 to 20 per, uh, times more than the normal tick infestations. And they used to have 4,000 moose in the 80s in northwest Minnesota. By the mid-2000s, they now have less than 100. And the same problems are happening, uh, happening in Maine. And I bring it up because you have that tick here, the Alva uh, pictus tick. And it also goes after uh, other kinds of uh, game animals. And so um, that could become very problematic. OK. So what are the significant players in Lyme disease? Most people think you have to have deer. That is not necessarily true, because what happens is that the ticks pick up the uh, disease from a, a host, which is usually a small mammal. In the east, that's the white-footed mouse, the vole, the chipmunk, the cute little eastern gray squirrel, the shrew, other small mammals, and birds, which is very significant. Now, on the west coast, the western gray squirrel, the wood rat, um, different species of birds uh, carry uh, those ticks. In the south, the cotton, uh, I'm sorry, they, uh, those ticks feed off of them and pick up the disease. In the south, the cotton mouse, the cotton rat, even lizards have the ticks and, and become reservoirs. So the deer acts as a meal and transport. 
So the ticks get on the, the deer and they get, I call them the bus when I talk to kids in schools. I say, yeah, they're the bus and they drive the ticks all over the place. And since they have a, a wide range often, that's why the ticks are, you know, sometimes getting further afield. And um, also, uh, the ticks like to feed the, the Xodes scapularis, which is the deer tick that produces Lyme disease. They like to feed on the deer. Apparently, there's something great in the blood. And often, they will f take their last blood meal there and even mate on the deer. And then they fall off and get down in the leaf debris. So this is a listing of a bunch of ticks, which I'm going to talk about. No need to mention them right at the moment. Um, now, this is I kind of think is very important. The top map shows what the CDC felt the tick situation looked like for deer ticks of both kinds, both the ones in the, the east, the, the black-legged tick, and then the western black-legged tick out in the west. And so at that time, 30% uh, of counties in the United States had the ticks that uh, carry and transmit Lyme disease. Now, if you look at the new map in this new study, 2015, and again, it comes out of uh, the Journal of Medical Entomology, and it was done by a team that included the CDC members. Now, there's about 50% of counties in the United States now have the tick vector for Lyme disease. And this map actually shows you the change over that time period. Uh, if there's a red, orange, or green box here, that means that increase the tick population in those areas. So you can see there was a lot of increases over that period of time. And now they say there's only seven states that do not have the tick vector, and Colorado they include as one of those. Now, Exodes scapularis, that is again the deer tick, it now transmits Borrelia burgdorferi, many of you may know that's the bacteria that's caused Lyme, but now they found a new strain and actually they found it in the Midwest called Borrelia mayonii, named after the Mayo Clinic, which was involved in the finding. That also now, they said, produces Lyme. Borrelia myomotui, which is, produces a Lyme-like illness, anaplasmosis, babesiosis, bartonellosis, or lichiosis, Powassan encephalitis virus, tick paralysis, and tularemia. Folks, all of these can be in the deer tick. And you can get something called co-infections, which means having more than one disease at the same time. One bite can produce, if the tick has those diseases, it can produce them in whoever is bitten. This is a photo of a deer tick laying eggs. That's called ovopositing. And this tick can lay two to 3,000 eggs. This is the deer tick with its stages and the eggs. And I'm not sure, let me see if I can get this pointer to point, ah, amazing. Okay, that's the larva. That's what hatches out of these eggs over here. Okay, you can see it looks almost transparent. And that larva generally, most all the time, is born uninfected. It means it doesn't have, with Lyme disease anyway, it may have some of the other diseases in it, but usually it's born uninfected. There's a couple of studies indicating that maybe on occasion uh, one of those might be, one or so might be infected. But generally it's considered born uninfected. Then when it bites something like I mentioned to you, the white-footed mouse, the squirrels, it picks up the disease from them. And then it goes on to its other stages. And when it's first born, it only has six legs. And uh, then afterwards, in its other stages, it has eight legs. And I mention this because I had a neighbor, a former neighbor, once who called me over, freaked out. Her very young baby had somehow gotten into a, a, a tick nest, as I, I don't know that that's the common terminology for it, but the kid did get in it. And he was completely covered. It was the first time, actually, that I had seen those ticks just born. He was completely covered with them. They were crawling all over him. And they were that clear, almost transparent, and had six legs. And it was rather horrifying, to be quite honest. Um, but anyway, this slide shows deer ticks and poppy seeds. The white in the center are the poppy seeds. 
And uh, you can see those are the sides of the nymph. That's why a lot of times it says that the ticks that cause Lyme disease are the size of poppy seeds. Not always true though, folks. And that's problematic because the doctors don't always, aren't even always recognizing that. But the adult ticks can also produce disease and do. In fact, they carry a higher percentage of disease in them. But usually what happens, because they're bigger, people you know, figure it out a little bit and get them off. Now this I thought was an interesting photo, and these are engorged female uh, black-legged ticks feeding on black bears in New Jersey, and yes, we have bears in New Jersey, and in fact, we've brought them back from extinction. Now they're swimming in our swimming pools in backyards, literally. Um, some of you might have seen some of the YouTubes that were around this last year. It was horrifying to see these bears come in the backyard, get in the pool, and start playing with the kids' floats. And the kids are in the house screaming because these bears are there. But that's another issue for another time. Uh, but nonetheless, what, the point is these ticks are on many different animals. Now, these are the ticks from the West, the Western black-legged legged ticks, Exodes pacificus, um, and they transmit uh, 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 anaplasma, Borrelia burgdorferi, Bar uh, Bartonella hensili, Babesia microti, and uh, do the same kind of damage you know, with Lyme disease. OK, this is a map of the Lone Star ticks. Now, currently, it appears that the Lone Star ticks haven't quite made it to you guys. But I will tell you, when I started, or well, not when I started. I've been doing this for about 32 years. But about 25 years ago, the Lone Star tick only ranged as far north. I live about approximately right under that dot there. and. Uh, uh, coastal New Jersey, and that's as far as these ticks went. These ticks are dangerous, folks. They are almost more dangerous than the deer ticks, and the reason is, is they're very fast. They motor on out. They don't wait on a piece of grass like or a, a branch like the deer ticks do for you to brush by. They actually will go after you. And I once spoke with a guy whose job was, I said, oh, I think I'd get a new job. But his job was photographing ticks for different publications. And he told me the story is he had a, uh, a nymph stage of one of these in the refrigerator, a bunch of them. And they were in the fr refrigerator. And he brought them out and he put them on his hand to photograph, that fast they came out of their stupor, if you will, and started crawling up his arms. And he said, I couldn't believe how fast they were because, you know, deer ticks don't generally aren't, you know, that fast. He said, they're dangerous. I said, yeah, I've heard it from the guys in the field who collect the ticks. So that's a map showing you where they are now. They're already uh, almost through Iowa. Um, and uh, that is unusual before they were um, pretty much limited to the south. Now, this tick carries something called star eye, southern tick associated rash illness. Looks like Lyme, acts like Lyme, uh, it's treated like Lyme. There's no, they don't know what the organism is that causes the disease. They used to think it was Borrelia lone star eye, they've decided it isn't. Um, and so here's a disease that's causing problems, it's in the lone star tick. If you're not in an, what they call an endemic state, if you get bitten and you get the rash and they can produce that same rash that looks like Lyme, your, your doctor may not treat you. So it's very problematic. That's the Lone Star chick laying eggs. They can lay thousands of eggs also. All right, Dermacenter variabilis, American dog chick. Now, I added in the center of this map, because it wasn't there, that you indeed have ticks in Colorado of the American dog tick. So this map, which came from the CDC, obviously needs some you know, updating because it's, it's a, I guess, quite a prevalent tick here. Now, that don't confuse that with the brown dog tick, which is a totally different tick. That tick almost always, not always, almost always stays and feeds on your dog. This tick is different. This is the uh, Dermacenter variabilis, American dog chick. It can cause tularemia, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, and tick paralysis, which I'll talk about in a little while. So <clears throat> this is, uh, can lay four to 6,000 eggs. Very exciting animals, these little guys. And sometimes the larvae, when they hatch out of those eggs, are already infected with Rocky Mountain spotted fever. 
Now this just shows you the size of that dog tick and the deer tick family. You can see uh, the size differential. The American dog tick is much larger. All right, this is the Rocky Mountain wood tick. The Rocky Mountain wood tick is definitely here. Um, it's very similar to uh, the American dog tick it's at Sturma Center Andersoni. And um, it produces Rocky Mountain spotted fever, Colorado tick fever, Q fever, tularemia, tick paralysis. And again, I will talk about those. All right, tick-borne relapsing fever. You guys out here are having sort of a, I don't know that I can call it uh, an epidemic. I'm not sure if it fits that criteria. But you're having some problems this last year or so with increase in cases of this tick-borne relapsing fever um, uh, semi-epidemic, I'll call it for lack of a better word. Okay, so here basically what it shows you, the map with the blue, um, those are, the blue dot shows, uh, each dot is in the county of residence of someone who has gotten the disease over this time, and the green shows the dot in the county of exposure. The CDC tries to distinguish between that, and I will talk about that disease uh, in a bit. This is uh, uh, Ornithodorus ticks, which I had to actually learn about because, again, I'm not a scientist. I've been doing this a long time. I absorb knowledge as I go along, and I didn't have to know a lot about it. <laughs> and I was very happy because when I knew about it, I found out that this guy lives for almost 20 years. That was kind of scary. The hard-bodied ticks usually live two and three years. This guy lives about 20. I, I can't even imagine and takes blood meals all during that time. Now you have them here, they're generally found in animal burrows, they're also found in uh, cabins off in the woods and stuff like that. That's oftentimes where people come in contact with them. Um, okay, then there's Ambliana, uh, Amblyona maculatum, that's the Gulf Coast tick. And that produces uh, our uh, rickettsia, uh, rickettsiosis, or rickettsia parkeri, rickettsiosis. Either way, if you want to give the longer name. And that is a picture showing you of that tick. Now, why am I showing you all these in the map? You need to see that these diseases are all over. These ticks are all over. There's no place that I have found in the United States yet that I think that we don't have ticks and disease. Now, this next part is interesting um, because uh, it was certainly something I was unaware of and Monica first brought it to my attention and I did know uh, one of the researchers, Bob Lane out of California, who did some of the studies on this, um, that basically this is a tick, Ixodes spinopalpus tick, and uh, it's found in the far western United States, Canada, and in Colorado, which is very significant. Okay, and it picks up disease from rodents, rabbits and hares, and what they call passerine birds. Passerine birds are, are songbirds, are birds that have uh, three legs going forward and one leg going back, and you see how they get on a perch, and they, uh, well, that's that kind of a bird. Okay, so anyway, this study was primarily done in six counties in Colorado, where rodents and ticks were collected and assayed for Borrelia burgdorferi, which is the agent of Lyme disease. And so four of the six counties produced 52 rodent and 39 uh, spinopolis uh, isolates of Borrelia burgdorferi. And so uh, both the I. scapularis and the uh, spinopalpus were shown to be competent vectors. That means that the life cycle of the bacteria is able to go on in the tick and so on and so forth. And so, um, and they, acqu that they uh, acquired the infection from the host reservoir mice and they were subsequently able to transmit it to other mice, which is very important to scientists. To me, that's not so important, but they have to establish, and I understand, they have to establish every step of the way what's really happening. So the conclusion of this study, and this was 1997, given that I scapularis are not found in Colorado and I uh, spinopalpus are restricted to the nests and burrows of rodents, and because of the semi-arid environment in Colorado, the risk of human contact with B. burdorferi, the agent of Lyme, C, appears to be low. Well, now we have another 
study in 2006, and this is one that Bob Lane was on in California. It was done in Mendocino County. And they found that three species of Ixodes ticks, which included the Spinopolis, most commonly were found openly questing, as opposed to the other study, which said, well, they don't really get in touch with humans very often. And they were openly questing in woodlands uh, with redwood present in the western part of the uh, county. And they said that these, uh, this tick is, uh, or is occasional human biter. And it's a known experimental vector of Borrelia burgdorferi. And it said, our study represents the first collection of large numbers of openly host-seeking ticks. All right, that was in 2006. Now, in 2015, in a Canadian study of the same tick, uh, they collected the ticks from the, the songbirds. And they said that, of course, wild birds play a vital role in the dispersal of ticks that harbor tick-borne pathogens, including Borrelia burgdorferi, again, the Lyme bacteria. So they found that 31% of 405 ticks, which were collected from 21 species of birds in far western Canada, were infected with Borrelia burgdorferi. And the western black-legged tick, and also the Ixodes pacificus, which is basically almost the same tick, and Ixodes spinopalpus played a limited role in the transmission cycle of Borrelia burgdorferi along coastal Bur British Columbia. And they also documented the first record of that tick in uh, Alberta. So, not, and they say, not only does the I. pacificus bite and transmit Borrelia burgdorferi, but Spinopalpus also bites humans. And as a Lyme disease vector tick, it could transmit Borrelia to humans. So in conclusion, they said, resident and migratory songbirds are, dis are do disseminate, they're disseminators of Borrelia. And, um, and they indicate basically that uh, most significantly cohabitation, meaning that these ticks are together and feeding and so on and in the environment, of these three types of ticks, or four types, including the Spinopalpus tick, increase the public health risk of contracting Lyme disease along Canada's Pacific coast. So this is important because now more and more research is showing that that tick could indeed, doesn't say that it does, could indeed possibly transmit Borrelia, that Borrelia organism, into people. And this is a picture of ticks mating. Uh, so how do ticks get on us? I already mentioned with the hard-bodied ticks, they generally do what's called questing. And you can see them on here. Uh, they're waiting on grass. And right there, right there, that's the, uh, west, that's the deer tick, and that's the American dog tick. And down here, this is the Ornithodorus ticks that I mentioned that live in the animal burrows. So what about tick attachment times? Many of you probably have heard, what does it take to get Lyme disease? And I'll speak specifically to that. Because some of the other diseases might have different time frames. Here's the real deal. They used to say 24, 36, 72 hours. Why they said that was because the organism that causes Lyme is usually found in what's called the mid-gut of the tick, which is like the stomach of the tick. And it takes that period of time for that organism to migrate up into the tick's salivary glands, which would be like having it in your mouth, right? And then once that happened, the tick could then transmit it to you. However, it's long been known and finally people are coming out and talking about it, that sometimes these ticks already have it in their salivary glands. Maybe, for example, they do an incomplete feeding. Maybe they bite something, and for whatever reason, it's like you, I, I take a bite of a steak, oh, maybe I don't want that, oh, that steak, that, that's no good. And I, I say, take it back and, and give me fish. Uh, well, maybe it's the same thing with them. No one really knows why they do incomplete feedings, but they know it happens. Well, when that happens, that process has started. Now, if it bites you, it decides 
decides to bite you rather than whatever it was biting before, that could already be in its salivary glands. So now we know that the big deal is the longer the tick is attached, the greater the risk of infection. But no one should tell you, well, you couldn't have it because that tick wasn't attached long enough. OK, this is the, uh, I call it the business end of the tick. And um, if you see, these, the, these are the mouth parts. Right here, that's called the hypostome. And it has these barbs on it. And it's kind of like my husband does a lot of fishing. And, and the, the fish hooks, you know, they have a little barby thing. That's kind of like this. So what happens? The tick secretes something, first of all, to numb you. Then it cuts you open. It sticks in this hollow uh, straw-like barbed hypostome. Then it secretes a glue-like substance, and it cements itself right to you. Then it sucks your blood. And sometimes it even secretes blood thinners and immune regulators. Get that, folks. Sometimes these ticks can be regulating your immune system. They're, they're taking it over. It, it's just f amazing what, what these guys can do. And not necessarily good amazing. <laughs> OK, so tick removal. This is really important. Don't put anything on the tick. Don't burn the tick. Don't touch the tick with your fingers. Don't squeeze the tick. Do use pointed tweezers close to the skin on the head end of the tick, or if you have a special tick remover tool. Pull it straight out. Don't squeeze it or, t uh, or twist it. And whatever you see on the internet, don't believe it about. Don't put Vaseline, gasoline, nail polish remover, liquid soap. Don't put any of those things on there. The reason is the tick may back out, but if it gets annoyed, it may be injecting all of whatever it has in you. And I've told you about what the, the deer tick itself has in you. And I haven't even told you what the other ones have yet. And so anyway, basically, that's what you do. Now, you can save it for a tick testing laboratories. Most of them prefer live in a Ziploc bag with a moist cotton ball, but you can ask them. Um, and also, you can stick, uh, uh, if you want to get rid of the tick, stick it in tape for disposal. Um, and because they can't get out of tape, they can, they can survive most other things. They can survive washing in the washing machine. They can survive some in the dryer, but if you do 35 minutes or so, that usually dehydrates and kills them. And that is the correct tick removal um, procedure. OK, the Lyme disease bullseye. Some things you may not know, less than 50% of people develop a bullseye rash. Some people develop no rash at all or other rash types. And this photo was from the late uh, Ed Masters in Missouri, who was just a wonderful uh, researcher and was looking at the Lone Star tick rashes and these. And he would get up and he'd say, I defy anybody in this audience, and they were all doctors, to tell me the difference between this rash from uh, Borrelia burgdorferi and this rash from the Lone Star tick. And we don't even know what's causing that rash. Of course, no one ever could. Um, OK, what about how a, a disease is treated? I'm not going to get into this. Dr. Cameron will be talking. But I want to talk just a minute about the guidelines about Lyme disease. There are two sets of guidelines uh, for Lyme disease treatment, and they're totally different. The International Lyme and Associated Diseases Society, which is ILADS, those are uh, professional uh, medical people. I also uh, belong to ILADS. Um, and basically, they have guidelines that uh, say that the doctor really needs to be the person who makes the decision uh, about how you should be treated. All right. Whereas the Infectious Disease Society of America guidelines, um, what they basically say is you can have three weeks of antibiotics. Rarely do they permit you to have more than that. On occasion for some neurologic, they will indicate that you could. Other than that, after the three weeks, you're done, even if you have continued symptoms. And that has been a huge part of the problem. Now, there's something called the National Guidelines Clearinghouse at the government level in Washington. And for a while, both sets of guidelines were on there. But the IDSA guidelines were removed because they're considered stale. After five years, um, the, guide, the National Guidelines Clearinghouse uh, removes them. And the IDSA is now working on new guidelines. So co-infections, I mentioned that earlier, meaning one tick bite 
can cause more than one disease. So this I entitled Lyme disease that you know. Now, why did I do that? Well, those of you that do know Lyme will know the Lyme caused by Borrelia burgdorferi, the, the deer tick, and uh, you know the, usually the fever, the headaches, muscle aches, chills, possible rash, um, and later uh, symptoms that can attack all the systems in the body. So most people have at least heard about that. Now, the new strain is Borrelia maonii, which produces Lyme, but it's a little bit different. They have those early symptoms. However, they also might include nausea and vomiting. They might have diffuse rashes rather than the more focused types of almost bullseye looking rashes. And they have a very high concentration of the bacteria in your blood. The Borrelia burgdorferi, you don't have much of that in your blood. That's been part of the problem with uh, testing and, and other things. So uh, that's the difference with the new strain. Of course, there haven't been many cases. I think something like six, I believe, um, to date on that. Now, Borrelia myomotoi, which is Lyme-like illness, and I mentioned that. A lot of states are now finding it in their ticks, and it's closely related to relapsing fever group of Borrelia, and it's also related to Borrelia burgdorferi and transmitted by the, the black-legged and the western black-legged ticks. It produces a Lyme-like illness. There is a PCR test, but it's, no, it's not yet widely available. The treatment is the same pretty much as for Lyme disease. Anaplasmosis. Um, again, this is uh, carried by the deer tick and the western black-legged tick. Um, and so uh, usually this has more high fever uh, and uh, more severe symptoms if you're co-infected with Lyme disease. Um, and it has all kinds of things. There is testing for it. And it also has some of the same treatment as for uh, Lyme disease. Ehrlichiosis, which uh, there is another organism now has at least three different ones that we know about, Ehrlichia chaffiensis, Ehrlichia owengii, and Ehrlichia murus-like, which is really exciting to learn all these things about <laughs> these. But what, the reason I mention them is because some of the tests will only pick up one of those strains. And because it says, oh, well, we don't have that in our area of the country. Well, now it's moving. And some of these strains I read the other day, some that we didn't even have in the East Coast are now coming there. Anyway, it's transmitted by the, uh, by the deer tick and um, that this can be a very serious illness. There are tests for it. And the treatment, again, is similar to for Lyme. Now, babesiosis. Uh, babesiosis is a little bit different. Um, and it's one of the more common co-infections with Lyme. It's caused by several types of babesia parasite. And uh, it's carried by deer ticks and western black-legged ticks. But you guys can get it here because it's also uh, carried through blood transfusions, which I'm going to mention a little bit more in a second. This is a disease that produces symptoms very similar to malaria. And there are tests for it. And uh, there are different treatments. And some of those treatments are evolving. And they may, may be, and usually are, uh, uh, different than the bacterial diseases that are carried by the ticks. Now, what's happening in the blood supply? Well, uh, basically, currently, there's no test licensed by FDA available for screening blood donors for Babesia, even though they already know that it causes deaths through transfusions and has, it, it's, and it causes a whole lot of, of cases. Um, and so this was a study uh, that was a retrospective study by, by Medi using Medicare beneficiaries of 10,301 uh, Babesia cases uh, from 2006 to 2013. And if you look there, whoop, well, could have looked there. <laughs> uh, that's uh, Colorado, and uh, you can see that there were cases there, um, and uh, you know, were they through blood transfusions? Um, I don't think anyone really knows the answers to, to that. Uh oh, now I messed up. Let me see here. Give me a second. Yeah, I'm going to get slideshow from current. I'm working. There I am. All right, thank you. 
Okay, I'll try not to do that again. <laughs> Okay, so what's happening as a result of this? There's been a lot of discussions in Washington. Believe me, one of the things they do best in Washington is talk, and I know I spend a lot of time down there, and I have to counter a lot of their talk. Um, and so, but basically, uh, in Rhode Island, because they had so many cases of blood transfused Babesia, that they, uh, an independent uh, blood place there, laid off 37 workers so that they could afford to actually begin blood screening for Babesia. So then the Red Cross in 2016 uh, took them up on that, and, and I guess it was sort of competitive, and they began a pilot program, and they're now screening blood. Now the FDA is recommending that there be, treat, uh, there be testing nationwide of the blood supply, but that hasn't happened yet. Okay, Bartonellosis, uh, this is transmitted by deer tick fleas, uh, cat scratch lice, um, and basically there are still some entities that don't necessarily think this is tick-borne, though it's found in the ticks. There are some studies that show it. I already talked to you about Southern Tick Associated Rash Illness, Star Eye, uh, that comes from the Lone Star Tick, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, the American Dog Tick, the Wood Tick, which of course you have, and the brown dog tick uh, cause um, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. It usually has the classic rash, and not always, 90% of the cases have it. Um, tularemia, uh, which is another disease that also can be uh, transmitted in other kinds of ways, but you can see that's like a nasty um, um, bite there uh, in a tick-borne tularemia. And in 2015, there was an increase in Colorado tularemia cases, also in Nebraska, South Dakota, and Wyoming. Um, from tw 1983 to 2013, they had uh, over four years, th they, I'm sorry, they averaged four cases per year. In 2015, they had 52 cases. Um, and so who knows whether that's coming through tick bites or some other way is not definitely known. The Powassan virus, very serious in the Northeast and the Upper Midwest now, though also the Rocky Mountain wood ticks do carry it, though I've not seen any uh, cases out here. Um, and this has a high fatality rate, 10, 15% fatality rate. And so, and unfortunately, there's no treatment for it. Um, and oftentimes it's not found. Uh, the Heartland virus, that's a new virus discovered in 2009 in Missouri. Now it's already been found in Tennessee and Oklahoma. That's transmitted by the Lone Star Tick. Um, there is some testing for that, no treatment. Unfortunately, these virals are a disaster, these tick-borne virals. This is the bourbon virus, and no, it's not the kind of bourbon that you might have prior to or after dinner. Um, it's a county in Kansas, and um, basically the first case was in there in 2014. That patient died, and the second case was in Oklahoma in 2015. That patient survived, and they believe that it is uh, tick-borne because there was history of tick bites. Colorado tick fever, of course, that's your forte, if you will, and that's found in the Western US and Canada. Uh, it's no longer tracked by your health department, even though they say it's the most common tick-borne disease in Colorado. That makes no sense to me whatsoever. Uh, that's transmitted by the Rocky Mountain wood tick, and uh, there are tests for it, and the treatment for it, again, they don't have a real treatment, they have supportive care. Tick-borne relapsing fever, that's the one I mentioned to you uh, about the uh, Ornithodorus ticks. That's a picture of one of the Ornithodorus. And uh, there were 450 US cases reported from 1977 to 2000, but there is not mandatory reporting of it. And the largest reported case numbers during this period were in California, Colorado, Washington, Idaho, and Oregon from and June through September. Um, and so it is a bacterial infection, and it has a reoccurrence of, uh, the, of fever, like three days on with fever and seven days off. It also headache, muscle ache, and joint pain. Um, and again, it's linked to sleeping in rustic cabins, which are infested with these ticks. And they do have some uh, methods of diagnosing it and, of, and uh, treating it. Q fever is transmitted by the Lone Star tick and Rocky Mountain wood ticks. 
caused by another bacteria. Also, it can be gotten from inhaling dust from certain uh, animals that are infected with it. Uh, again, that's severe. Uh, they do have treatment for it. Uh, Rickettsia parkeri rickettsiosis, I, uh, rickettsiosis I mentioned to you from the Gulf Star, Gulf, Gulf Coast tick. And uh, basically, in 2016, they found two new cases in Arizona where that tick that carries it isn't even there. Well, guess what they found, folks? There's a new tick. It's made its way up from South America, Amblyona tris tick. And there's uh, Rickettsia species 36D, which is another disease found in Northern California. Tick paralysis caused by a neurotoxin. That is carried by the Rocky Mountain wood tick, American dog, lone star, and deer ticks. So what happens is the paralysis starts at your feet and works its way up and you become completely paralyzed. The only way to do anything about it is they have to find and remove the tick. Uh, tick bite meat allergy, this is now huge back east. Uh, the Lone Star tick bite can cause a meat allergy and people can and do go into anaphylaxis shock from it and they can no longer eat red meat. It's becoming very problematic and a lot of people and doctors don't know about it. So these are a list of some of the ticks in Colorado that Colorado State University, they have a whole list of ticks but I just, I already mentioned all of those and uh, I'm not gonna get into what they said about them. So quickly, they, uh, the government this last year, we were able to actually get a bill passed, and I'm just breezing through this because it's not really that significant, but what it means is, bottom line, that the, uh, the government, we were able to get into the Department of Defense appropriations, congre congressionally directed medical research funds. Very hard to get in there. It's for military, that, that, that funding is for the military. And so, but the research that comes out of it is for military and civilian. And I was appointed to their, uh, to the committee to oversee the, five, the first five million dollars. The good news about it is that it may, um, Basically, the bottom line is it, it we probably once you get it in the program, it's hard to get in, but usually it stays there. And I just thought you'd be interested. This is a map we got in 2002. We went down to uh, Maryland to Aberdeen Proving Grounds at the Army. They have been mapping Army bases across the country since 1980s, folks, for tick-borne risk. We do have a bill in the Senate we'd like to see passed with uh, Richard Blumenthal, and you can find information on our website. And I was also invited down to the American Association for the Advancement of the Sciences to speak about tick-borne disease and uh, this last year, which is really great because they wanted to know from a, a patient perspective what we thought the important things were. And finally, and I don't want to run out of time to give you this because I just think this is how important this all is. I always wondered, can we escape ticks? Well. Here's what scientists have discovered. Globally distributed seabird ticks, Exodes urii, are associated with penguins, penguins on Macquarie Island. They contain four new viruses whose closest relatives are found in the northern hemisphere. And they're arboviruses and they're transmitted by arthropods, ticks. And they are infesting colonies of king, royal, and rockhopper penguins on the sub-Antarctic Macquarie Island. Professor Subare, quote, even though these are seabird viruses, immunosuppressed people might become infected if they were bitten by a tick. However, Exodes urii usually prefer to feed on birds rather than humans, so the chances are low. However, one more note. The subatomic, I'm sorry, subatomic, yes. The subantarctic southern hemisphere, just north of the Arctic Circle, which contains the Campbell Islands and Isle Crozet, and this is a quote from uh, a researcher there. The zoonosis Lyme disease is caused by the spirochete Borrelia burgdorferi, which is carried by seabirds transmitted by Exodes ticks. It has been found through DNA analysis in ticks on the Campbell Islands and the Isle Crozet. King penguins on the Isle Crozet have antibodies to Borrelia burgdorferi, folks. That means these penguins have been exposed to Borrelia burgdorferi, and here they are, 
bound by the Antarctic. I, th I don't know about you, but I found that to be completely startling. And this is a penguin rookery. Uh, and when I went online to get permission from this woman who took this photo, she turns out she was in Australia. And she said to me, well, why would you want to present this? I presented this at another Lyme conference. Why would you want to present this at a Lyme conference? And I told her about Lyme. So I don't have to worry about it because we live in Australia. And I said to her, wrong. I said, Australia has had Lyme, and now they're finally recognizing it. And so she, she texted me or so, something six months later or so and said to me, guess what? I saw it in a window. I was walking down the street, and there was a notice about Lyme disease and a Lyme disease meeting. I couldn't believe it. So that's very coincidental. But it shows you how this is how we communicate and get our message out there. So I feel sorry for those penguins. Uh, and I feel more sorry for all of our patients across this great country and across the world. And I thank you very much and everyone on here for your attention and your help in getting this set up.